grand performance, USA. The greatest entertainers in America, as requested by you, the fighting men of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. Command performance! Presented this week and every week, till it's over, over there. Hi there, buddy. It's command performance time in the USA, and the American entertainment world is yours to command. Here's this week's first letter from Corporal J.R.B. in Australia. He says, Dear command performance, how's the feud getting on between Fred Allen and Jack Benny? Well, Corporal, the best answer I can give you to that is this. Here he is, the eastern half of the feud. The man with two baggy knees and eyes to match, Fred Allen in person. Thank you, thank you, and greetings to all you soldiers, sailors, and Marines. And Harry, answering Corporal J.R.B.'s letter, the Benny Allen feud has slowed down a little. Benny wanted to get his second win, but the man who owns the oxygen tent wanted his money in advance. <laughs> and as far as I know, Benny is still in the oxygen tent dickering. You know, it takes two to make a feud, Harry. I'm here ready to fight the minute Benny comes east. He uh, was coming to New York last week. He heard you could buy defense stamps cheaper at Macy's, and he was coming on here. And as I understand it, Benny started to hitchhike from Hollywood, but the gasoline and rubber shortage held him up. He stood out on the Lincoln Highway for two days without seeing a single car. The best offer Benny got was from a man who was walking east. And this man offered to take Benny piggyback as far as Kansas City. And Benny turned him down. He refused to go piggyback because it wasn't kosher. So he's still out on Lincoln Highway as far as I know. But, <laughs> but enough about the old boy with the locked-in billfold. Our show opens... Our show opens with an answer to a request from a soldier in the land of the Shamrock. He wants to hear his favorite singer, Kenny Baker. Now, Kenny sings, Johnny Doughboy Found a Rose in Ireland. Johnny Doughboy Found a Rose in Ireland Sure the fairest flower that e'er and never grew Took him back to old New York Cause his mother spoke the sweetest Barney too Johnny Doughboy found a rose in Ireland And she stole his heart with smiling eyes of blue He said, darling, tis my duty to make American beauty of a sweet Irish rose like you. Johnny Doughboy sailed away, and it was his lucky day, even though the skies were gray above. On that isle across the sea, Johnny's making history with his Yankee Doodle on the blood. Johnny Doughboy found a rose in Ireland, sure the fairest flower that ever and never grew. For oh, the Blarney. Took him back to old New York Cause his mother spoke the sweetest Blarney too Johnny Doughboy found a rose in Ireland And she stole his heart with smiling eyes He said, darling, it is my duty Of a sweet Irish rose like you. Thank you.
Thank you. That was swell, Kenny. Now, here's an unusual request by way of the Hawaiian Islands. It says, Dear Command Performance, last week you had a fellow on named Henny Youngman. We'd never heard him before, but the guy's a riot. How about a second helping? Signed, Private L.E.W. U.S. Marine Corps. Well, Private L.E.W., all you did was order a New York police escort for Henny Youngman to sprint him from Low State Theater. He pulled in here 14 seconds ago, short on breath, but long on laugh. Making his second appearance on command performance, Henny Youngman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you, Fred. The great guy that's Fred Allen. Just recommended me to the Astor Hotel. That's where I'm stopping. I have a room there with an adjoining towel. <laughs> Can imagine how big the room is. I had a headache last night. The guy I saw took the aspirin. <laughs> Walked into my room last night and I found a strange girl there. I said to her, I'll give you just 48 hours to get out of here. <laughs> That's fair, I thought. Since I was on command performance last, I've been out to the coast, met all the big stars out there. In fact, Martha Ray kissed me. I lost my head completely. <laughs> That's the first time I was ever kissed on a mouth and a forehead at the same time. <laughs> she kisses like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> she used to come and see me every night at a nightclub I worked in. I worked in a lovely spot. This place was in a cellar, sort of an upholstered sewer. <laughs> no cover, no minimum, no people. No salary, no nothing. <laughs> you can imagine how bad business was. A fellow came in and asked for a change of $5. They wanted to make him a partner. <laughs> Lovely boss, too. He used to stab me. Good night. <laughs> Lovely element of people. I love them. 12 o'clock at night, we used to have a five-minute intermission to carry out the wounded. <laughs> From out of nowhere, one guy walked up to me. He said, I'll bet you $10 you're dead. Can you believe it? I was afraid to bet him. <laughs> I invited a girl there one night. Could she eat? She had an appetite like a bird, a vulture. <laughs> when she started to eat, her two poor couples got up to dance. <laughs> then I ordered. I had a steak. I don't know what kind of meat it was, but every time I swallowed, it went... <laughs> I called a waiter over. I said, look, take the steak back. I can't cut it. He said, I'm sorry, we can't take it back now. You've already bent it. <laughs> a wise guy. So I got up. I took a punch at him. Then I got up again. <laughs> so think of me, you wouldn't, let, you wouldn't think I could fight. Well, I can. I'm married. Although I haven't spoken to my wife in the last four weeks. I didn't want to interrupt her. <laughs> My wife has a nice, even disposition. Miserable all the time. <laughs> Lately, she's had a slight impediment in her speech. She stops to breathe. <laughs> Brother, can she talk? I had her at the beach last summer when she got home, her tongue was sunburned. <laughs> it's all over now. We just got divorced. She won the custody of her parents. And speaking of her parents, I'd like to sing a little song dedicated to my mother-in-law entitled, I See Your Face Before Me From the Picture I Wake Up Screaming. <laughs> I'll be accompanied by Al Goodman, and this makes you want to sit this one out dance orchestra. <laughs> May I have a little introduction, Al, please? Thank you. Same tempo as the Carnegie Hall, please. <laughs> Just a little louder, please. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> if I keep moving, I'm no fool. Since I wash my panties and lust, I get every dance. I 
just made up my mind of where I'm going to spend my vacation, around Veronica Lake. They all laughed at me when I came out in my shorts, and when I bent over, they split. <laughs> you know, I just saw a picture without Don Amici. <laughs> I am Peggy George's husband, aren't you? Happy folks, wear a trust. <laughs> Thank you, Henny. Comes now a letter from an army chaplain somewhere in the South Pacific. The other night he writes. We were chatting about command performance, and believe me, it would do your hearts good to watch the men here as they listen to the sports news, comedy, and popular music you send us each week. However, I frequently hear a desire expressed for such great artists as, for example, Gladys Swarthout. I pass this on to your consideration. Not merely for our consideration, Chaplain, but for our action. For here is the great artist whom you have requested, Miss Gladys Swarthout, who sings for you, Bless This House. Fellas, so many of your letters ask for the latest news in baseball, track, boxing, horse racing, and American sports in general, that Command Performance has decided to carry a regular sports page of the air. Editor this week is that eminent sports writer and mental giant of the quiz world, John Kieran. Soldiers, sailors, and marines, not necessarily in that order. Here we go with a few remarks on what's afoot or at hand in sport. Private J.L. Barrow, Fort Dix, Joe Lewis, to us civilians. 
has his muscles all flexed to meet Ample Abe Simon. That's right, fight him again. Everybody except Ample Abe and his manager were convinced the first time. The second meeting will be at Madison Square Garden on Friday night. They say Simon is in great shape now. Everybody Joe Lewis meets is in great shape until the fight starts. <laughs> Joe fought once for the Navy Relief Society. This time it's for the Army Emergency Fund. This will balance the books, even if it upsets Abe Simon. Don't laugh, boys. Ample Abe will be doing his best. Gus Lesnovich, world's right heavyweight champion, enlisted in the Coast Guard the other day, which recalls that Red Cochran, the welterweight champion who joined the Navy some months ago, couldn't make the welterweight limit now unless he sawed off a leg. Boy, the chow in the Navy must be wonderful. The climax of a great indoor track season is just ahead. On Wednesday night in the Bronx Coliseum, there will be a whirling finish to the board floor campaign. A fellow named Gil Dodds, who began by taking correspondence courses in running, has certainly proved the value of the United States mail. This Gil Dodds, after running Gregory Rice a great two-mile, switched to the mile to meet Leslie McMitchell at the indoor championship. Running practically as a novice at that distance, he stole a long lead and held enough of it to win by a whisker for McMitchell in 4.083. They had a return match in the Colombian mile of the KSC. And Dodd, in the lead, turned the first half in under two minutes. Sensational. That left them both breathless, but McMitchell saved enough energy to pass Dodds in the last lap and win by a short head in 4.08 even. Now the runoff, a rubber match, is coming up Wednesday night in the Bronx. It should pack the house. To, uh, to the advantage of the Navy Relief Society for which the net profits will go. The Major League Ball Clubs are still warming up in exhibition games, but it's hard to tell what will come of it. Selective Service Board marching orders are bound to make changes in the batting order. Anyway, the Dodgers are leading in publicity so far. If there are any other big changes, you'll hear about them. So long, boys. <laughs> Thank you, John Kieran. And now, in response to a request from some Marines down in the Caribbean, Al Goodman and his gang play the number one song on the hit parade, Deep in the Heart of Texas. <laughs> from a cook in the U.S. Army, and if the postmark is any criterion, he hasn't had his ears glued to the radio this past winter in search of new recipes for icebox cookies and frosted dessert. It's from Private L.F.J. somewhere in Alaska who says, Dear Command Performance, on one of our shows you gave us the season's most popular songbird, Dinah Shore. On another you gave us the songbird of the South, Kate Smith. Now they're both mighty good. But the songbirds I'm lonesomest for are the ones that used to wake me up every morning back home in Indiana. That sure would be sweet music to my ears. Well, Private, I think this specially made recording is the answer to your request. Those were authentic Indiana birds. Now, for any serviceman who happened, uh, men rather, who happened to be from uptown New York, and our lonesome for the famous Bronx bird. <laughs> that was the Bronx bird in a special arrangement dedicated to A. Schickeldruber. 
And now, an encore for the actor. <laughs> We extend our brotherly sympathy and understanding to Lieutenant R.J.L., who writes, Dear Command Performance, a couple of years ago at Columbia University, we chose Madeline Carroll as the girl we prefer to be stranded with on a desert island. Well, brother, here I am on a desert island. <laughs> and I don't want to be obvious, so let me put it this way. I'd like to have Command Performance give us Madeline Carroll. Lieutenant, take the sand out of your shoes and get a good grip on yourself, for here she is, glamorous, beautiful, charming, Madeline Carroll. <laughs> well, how, uh, how do you do, Miss Carroll? How do you do, Mr. Allen? Miss Carroll and Mr. Allen. <laughs> Sounds rather formal, doesn't it? Yes, it sounds like a blind date getting together in the lobby of the YW to me. <laughs> but why don't you just call me Madeline, Mr. Allen? I'll call you Fred. Well, now we're all set. Now, before we tee off, Madeline, there are two ardent fans of yours waiting to meet you. This is Portland, Madeline. You're cute, Portland. You're cute, too, Miss Carroll. I'm cute, too, Miss Carroll. Now, Ken. <laughs> Uh-uh-uh. Wait till you're introduced. I jumped the gun, brother. <laughs> Are you really so anxious to meet me, Kenny? I ain't here waiting for a streetcar, sister. <laughs> Kenny Baker, where are your manners? Look, brother, there's no time for manners. This is a primitive Baker talker. <laughs> primitive Baker with two pairs of pants, yes. And this is the Neanderthal Allen talking, Primitive Baker. Now, you drop your caveman approach, and you say something nice to Miss Carroll. Well, I saw your last picture, Bahama Passage, Miss Carroll. Did you like it, Kenny? Gosh, there was one scene I'll never forget. Which one was that? It was a love scene. It was night. Nice. You were standing beneath the palm tree. Moonbeams danced in your beautiful golden hair. Sterling Hayden kissed your lips to his. Yes. And then the scene faded out on a pineapple. <laughs> See, it was beautiful. You know, Miss Carroll, there's one thing I wanted to know. What was that, Kenny? Was that a real pineapple? Now go away. Go away. Please, Kenny, Madeline and I have a rendezvous with the cliché here. Okay, but I'll be back, Miss Carroll. Now, don't, don't, don't bother. Now, Madeline, let's talk about you. What is your ambition, your hobby, your telephone number? I haven't any hobbies. My telephone's cut off, and the last picture I made at Paramount hasn't been released yet, so... Well, I really haven't anything to talk about. Dead, a Hollywood actress with nothing to say? This interview will make radio history. <laughs> yes, I don't smoke, don't use any special shampoo, and I haven't got a sweater to my name. You're, uh, you're just a home girl, Madeline, and I'm going to see that you get home tonight. <laughs> well, thank you, Fred. <laughs> Tell me, have you, uh, have you ever seen me in pictures? Yes, Fred, I have. You're not uh, just saying that to be nice. Have you really, really seen me in pictures? Well, honest, I have the dishes at home to prove it. <laughs> well, tell me, Madeline, why can't, why can't I make good in Hollywood? I can't understand it, Fred. You have Errol Flynn's hair. Yes. You have Donna Meachie's eyes. Yes. You have Tyrone Parr's profile. Yes. I can't understand it, Fred. What? On you, it comes out Boris Karloff. <laughs> What has Robert Taylor got that I haven't got, and where can I get it after he's through using it? <laughs> Did you see that last picture I made, and I do mean last picture I made, with Jack Benny? I saw the trailer. You didn't see the picture, you just saw the trailer. Yes, I got the idea. Oh, you got the... Well, you saw enough to tell me one thing, Madeline. How does Benny stay in pictures? Well, Jack is photogenic, Fred. He screams well. Screams well, she says. A guy with no hair, he enamels his gums. His legs look like two swans' necks. His Adam's apple hangs down like a skin pendulum, and he screams well. 
Well, the camera is kind to some people and unkind to others. Oh, excuse me, Miss Carroll. Yes, Jenny? I'd like to have you meet a friend of mine. Oh, I'd be glad to. Miss Carroll, may I present Mr. Von Zell? I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Von Zell. I am thrilled, Miss Carroll. That's all I can say. Thank you. Here's your 50 cents, Jenny. Thank you. <laughs> How do you like a thing like that? Selling an introduction. Oh, I'm sorry, Madeline. Anything is apt to happen on this program. Oh, that's all right, sir. You can't upset me. I'm so very, very happy. You uh, have a reason? Yes, Fred, you see, all my life I've wanted to appear with a great comedian. And you have finally realized your ambition. Yes. On April the 1st, I'll be at the Paramount with Bob Hope. <laughs> Hope? Bob Hope. He's a big comedian. Hope. You know I've heard that the name someplace. Hope. Is he that Hope in Hope Along Cassidy? Is that the... <laughs> Oh, he's a comedian. And you say he's in pictures? Yes, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Crosby, huh? Hope and Crosby. Oh, no, they've been in several pictures with Dorothy Lamour. Oh, Dorothy Lamour. <laughs> well, that explains it. You mean to say you've never seen Bob and Bing? There are only two things you see in a Dorothy Lamour picture, Madeline, <laughs> and they are not Hope and Crosby. <laughs> What are the two things, Fred? Dorothy and her sarong. <laughs> but you're not, you're not worried about working with this Hoke or Hope or whatever his name is. Well, yes. Frankly, I am a little concerned. I thought you might give me some advice on how to get along with a comedian. Oh, to get along with any comedian, Madeline, all you have to do is laugh at the comedian's jokes. Oh, That's I see. Oh, well, Miss Carroll. Oh, uh, yes, Kenny. Miss Carroll, may I present Mr. John Kieran? I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Kieran. I'm thrilled, Miss Carroll. That's all I can say. Thank you. Kenny. Yes? Here's your 50 cents. Thanks, John. Now, wait. wait. <laughs> of all the nerves. Wait till I get that little middleman after the program. <laughs> oh, it's all right, Fred. I honestly don't mind. I know you don't mind, but he's apt to come through here with a tour, Madeline, any minute. <laughs> Say, before I forget it, there's something I wanted to ask you. What's that, Fred? The lieutenant who requested your appearance on command performance mentioned that his college had chosen you as the girl the average student would prefer to be stranded with on a desert island. Yes, Fred, I must say I was very flattered. Well, have you ever thought about your choice, the man? I mean, if you if you had to be stranded on a desert island... Well, not until now, Fred. Madeline, you mean... Yes, Fred, and I'm serious. You would be my choice. But, Madeline, I'm no Cary Grant. From the neck down, I look like George Olive. <laughs> I know, Fred, but you're still my choice. Well, why, Madeline? Your chest is so enormous, Fred. Yes. Your lungs seem so strong. Yes. On a desert island, yes. you'd be just the man to yell for help. I see what you mean. I, uh... Oh, Miss Carroll. Yes, Kenny? Miss Carroll, I'd like to have you meet Sam, the janitor. No, you don't, Kenny. This is the last straw, Madeline. Yeah. Goodbye, Fred. Goodbye, and Goodbye. thank you, Miss Madeline Carroll. <laughs> Well, fellas, fellas, radio being what it is, the script and the time allotted to us are coming out neck and neck. Ordinarily, that extra neck in there would be the sponsor looking over my shoulder. But in this case, you fellows are the sponsor. And maybe it won't sound too sentimental to say we're proud to have worked for you on, on your show, Command Performance. We tried to put our best into these microphones over here, and we hope you like what came out of your loudspeakers over there. This is Fred Allen saying... So long from the USA. Command Performance USA is broadcast every week at this time to the fighting men in Uncle Sam's armed forces. It's your show, men. Address your request to Command Performance USA in care of the station to which you are listening. And fella, give them hell. <laughs>